Uh, just a little bit introduction about Henry and the rest of the work Henry is going to do. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Henry Kim is director and CEO of the Awa Khan Museum in Toronto. This is one of the most dynamic museums in Canada with the mission to foster a greater understanding and appreciation of the contribution that Muslim civilization have uh, made to the world heritage. And believe me, I'm a witness to it and it was a great visit and great museum. I hope that everyone has a chance to visit. The museum is an initiative of Awa Khan Trust for Culture, an agency of the Awa Khan Development Network, and houses collections of Islamic and Persian art, Muslim culture, and heritage, including artifacts, which showcase the artistic, intellectual, and scientific contributions of Muslim civilizations. Through thought-provoking activities and events, talks, tours, readings, and gallery programs, the museum offers a unique opportunity for people of all ages and background to interact with the museum's collections, exhibitions, and experts. Dr. Henry Kim received his education from Harvard and Oxford. He's an ancient historian and Greek archeologist by training, having spent over 21 years in museums and universities. Dr. Kim claims that the combination of museums and universities has enabled him to use ancient objects for teaching by drawing information and stories from them. The objects in the museum tell tales of diversity, multiculturalism, and how cultures actually interacted and engaged with each other. From this inquisitive study of objects, he extrapolates how collect cultures connect and how these artifacts act as mediators, as all represent cross-cultural associations. Before joining the Aga Khan Museum, he was associated with the University of Oxford, where he taught, curated collections, and managed capital projects at the Ashmolean Museum for, from 1994 <coughs> to 2012. He also served as curator of Greek coins and a lecturer in Greek numismatics at the university. From 2004 to 2011, he was the project director for the Ashmolean Redevelopment Project, overseeing a 70, pound, uh, 70 million pound redevelopment and transformation of the museum, which was a great job. The museum community is in the midst of a vast and destabilizing transformation. As many institutions expand, both literally and metaphorically, others are being downsized or facing funds cuts, we all know that. At the same time, the role of the traditional museum is being interrogated. A new, highly in inventive museum models are springing up. As we look to the future, we ask, what role does museum collections and artifacts play? Uh, shaping our collective future. How will museums be tested over the next 10 years? If traditional museum models falter, should they be saved? And importantly, how can museums reinvent themselves to mean more to more people? This is the question we are all facing all over the world. Today, we have Dr. Henry Kim here with us at the AKU, and we are grateful to him for delivering his enlightening talk on Can Museums Be Brave? Reinventing the Role of Museums Today. Ladies and gentlemen, may I present Dr. Henry Kim. Thank you very much, and it's a great honor and privilege to be here at AKU to speak to this audience. And I, first of all, want to thank you for being here because um, this is a medical establishment. Why should you be here learning about museums or about culture or heritage? Um, in fact, when you look at culture and heritage, it's a very different game, a di very different world than healthcare and hospitals and universities. I think that one of the great things about medicine, about healthcare, universities, people always look to these institutions and you know exactly what it's there for. Everyone needs healthcare. And so it's, a, one, it's one of the basic privileges, it's one of the basic rights, it's one of the basic services that people have within a society. But what exactly is the role of art and culture within society? And I think that's probably one of the most interesting questions in this day and age, because I think that when you look at art and culture, it's very much there to enhance the quality of life. But the question is, how does it enhance the quality of life? In what ways can art and culture make, be relevant to people and actually improve the way that people live their lives on an everyday basis 
or even interact with one another. And so I think that when you look at the field of arts and cultures, it's always in this continuous flux of trying to understand what its role in society is. That's very different than hospitals. People know what hospitals are there for. But the arts and culture always have to undergo some form of navel-gazing or redefinition as you move from generation to generation. And I think that what's happening in this day and age is that when you look at museums and art and culture, there's a very different way of viewing it than there was a generation ago. And so what I'm going to be speaking to you about is a way of looking at museums and trying to understand how museums are themselves trying to project themselves to the public. Because I think that when you compare this to perhaps the museums you went to as a child, there's a very different museum that's facing the public today. And that, I think, is very exciting. And so what I'd really like to talk about <coughs> is how museums truly can reinvent themselves over time. What are the forces that are pushing them in these different directions? But also, the excitement that there can be by looking at very traditional institutions, but redefining them in ways that are more relevant to this day and age. And what that means is that museums no longer are simply top down, we provide information. Museums today are much more interactive places where they have to view their public and society as a whole first, before they start thinking about what they put out on display. 50 years ago, museums just put up beautiful works of art. But in this day and age, Museums are seeking relevance. They're looking at ways in which their collections can be used to tell stories. They're also being used, they're also looking at how what they have as information, as understanding, as learning, can actually affect the very nature of society. And I'd like to really just take you through this journey um, over the course of the next 30 or 40 minutes, just to give you an idea of what museums are undergoing today. But first of all, I'd like to start with a little bit of background so you understand where I come from. Because when I say that I've worked in museums my entire uh, career, it, it's absolutely true. Over 20 years I've spent in museums. And I think a lot of people wonder, well, what do you do in a museum for 20 odd years? And uh, it's a very good question. Well, the answer is, if you really are interested in museums, you tear them down and you build them up again. And I'm, 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 I've actually had the pleasure of doing that and actually uh, open to very, very distinctly different museum projects. But again, museums, museum projects that really speak to this changing way of looking at the arts and culture and society in this day and age. So let me first of all begin with my current museum, the Aga Khan Museum. And I'm very pleased to say that in, in front of this audience, I think most of you know about the Aga Khan Museum because we are sister organizations. We at least share the first two parts of our name with one another. And that's a wonderful thing to actually share in common. Now, the Aga Khan Museum was opened only three years ago. So in September 2014, the museum opened its doors. And it was an amazing initiative, um, really spearheaded by His Highness the Aga Khan. And what you see here on this slide is simply one of the exterior views of the museum. I think all of you can appreciate that His Highness is very interested in architecture. And when you look at this building, architecture is the first thing you see. It's very important in terms of how you look at the museum. And he used the Japanese architect Fumi Gamaki, a Pritzker Award-winning architect, to design the building. When you look at the building itself, it's very impressive. The interior of the building is very light. In fact, when His Highness commissioned Maki to design the concept design of the museum, uh, he actually wrote um, Professor Maki a five-page letter um, any of you who've had letters from His Highness know that five pages is very long. He likes them short. But he wrote five pages in which he explained to uh, Professor Maki that he wanted this museum and its building to be founded around the principle of light. Not only light as a physical force, brightening up spaces on the inside, but also as a metaphor for enlightenment, learning, and education. Because when you look at museums, first and foremost, Museums are educational institutions. They are there for learning. And so for His Highness, it was very important that this museum not be viewed as a repository of a wonderful collection of Islamic art. But he wanted it to be used as an educational institution. And so there is a very big difference between those two. In the past, people built museums simply to house collections. 
for His Highness, there was actually much deeper meaning behind this museum. In fact, when he looked at this museum, he said, look, I don't want this simply to be a repository of the arts. It's there so that we can improve people's understanding and appreciation of the arts and culture of the Muslim world. And by doing so, to understand who Muslims are and what exactly Islam is. And this is very important because when you look at this day and age, I think that understanding of Muslims and Islam is probably at, its, at one of its worst stages worldwide. There are more misconceptions today than there may have been 20, 25 years ago. And so building this museum was actually a bold statement by His Highness, a statement in which he actually said, look, I want to improve the situation, and let's do it through the medium of art, because the arts are one of the areas where it's neutral ground. There's no ideology behind art as a whole. Art is there to be appreciated by people. And what museums can do, and what they're very much designed to do, is that through the arts, through looking or experiencing or even smelling the arts, you actually get a better sense of the people who actually made them, use them, commission these works. In other words, it's an educational experience just to see an object, because what should run through your mind are the questions such as, why was this made? What was it used for? Why did they choose this motif or this color versus another color? And the one thing about art is that it's universal. All cultures have some form of art. And so when you start looking at art, you can actually open your minds to who these people are. And it was very important for His Highness that this museum actually be based within the Western world, within the developed world. Because for him, it was very important that when it comes to promoting this understanding, of the arts and culture of the Muslim world, that it actually be done to audiences who are actually influencers and people who uh, will actually gain a lot from this understanding. And that's the reason why it ended up in the West. The reason for Canada, and in particular Toronto, was the fact that Canada and Toronto, as a country and a city, are some of the best exemplars of multiculturalism, diversity, and pluralism in the world. All I can say is that I moved to Toronto five years ago. I'm American, I'm British, I'm not Canadian yet, but my daughter who was born in Canada certainly is. And the one thing I'll tell you is this, Canada has a different outlook. It's much different than the States, and certainly given this day and age, um, and certainly the last, what is it, 12 months or so, or a little bit longer, how long has been Trump been in office? It seems like forever. <laughs> but I can certainly say, that the climate has changed so radically. And Canada remains one of these uh, bastions of open-mindedness. And I can tell you this, I've never been questioned in Canada why this museum exists. People simply ask us, what can we do to work with this museum? And I think that bears out His Highness's decision to look to Canada for this museum building. Now, the building itself is quite spectacular. Here, it, it, you, you get an idea of the interior space of the museum. Uh, one of the very interesting parts of the architecture is that the galleries are actually open to one another, whether it's on one floor or from one floor to another. And so this is a very unusual thing, because typically museums like small boxes and connecting them through doorways and it's calling gallery one, gallery two. This is very much an open plan space. And again, the reason for this is the idea behind openness and enlightenment. Don't close cultures, don't keep them apart from one another, create this open atmosphere. And again, this is something that is, whoops, some, this is something that's uh, a bit more current in museum design today, where you are no longer having closed galleries, but ones that are open. And I'll show you a few examples of that in just a moment. Now, one of the other things about this museum that's very important is that it's not simply a place for visual arts. It's also a place for the performing arts. And His Highness was very clear when this museum was being designed that he wanted all art forms, whether it was artwork on walls, artwork in showcases, or the performing arts, music, dance, poetry, all of that should actually happen. Film should happen. And for this reason, there's a beautiful auditorium, which is probably not dissimilar in size to this one here and certainly as rich as this in terms of the architectural decoration, there's a 350 seat auditorium in the museum and we actually host about 50 to 60 live performances a year 
bringing in traditional artists from throughout the Muslim world, as well as um, contemporary artists who actually interpret and reinterpret music and combine modern with traditional forms. And it's one of the most exciting spaces of this museum as a whole. Now, in terms of what we have as a museum, well, we are an art museum. And for this reason, we have a spectacular collection of art from the historic Muslim world. We have just under a thousand objects. And what's most impressive is that some of the objects are some of the greatest objects that have ever been made within the Muslim world. For example, our, our, our so-called Shatamas Shaname, which comes from the 16th century. It's incredible because it's not only um, a very vivid and very well-executed um, Persian painting, um, it's also exceptionally detailed. And as I move in on the details and show you closer and closer up shots, it's incredible because when I tell you that this painting, and again, we're only seeing a very small close-up shot of it, that entire painting is no bigger than A4 sheet of paper. And yet, you can blow it up with that figure about a meter and a half tall, and you can see all of the detail in very crisp uh, form. And so what you see here in this case is one of the greatest paintings of all time because the artistic abilities of the painters was tremendous, being able to get details down to this level. But I think one thing that's very important about artwork it's, is it's not just about the physical form, it's also about what you can learn about the objects. And when I call this Persian painting, it is Persian court painting from the 16th century. But one thing that's very surprising is that when you look at the figures in this particular painting, they look actually a lot more like me <laughs> than what you might consider quote unquote Persian. In fact, the one thing that's very startling about this painting is that it's exceptionally Chinese in nature, not only in terms of the way people look, and again, there is a reason that Persians during this time look a little bit more Chinese, a thing called the Mongol invasions a couple centuries before, but there's also tremendous stylistic influence happening from the Chinese world. Persia and China, China were very closely linked throughout the Safavid period. And what it shows you is actually something that's wonderful, which is that even though we call something distinctly Persian, there's actually an amazing amount of cross-cultural influence that takes place between these regions. And I think one of the key things about looking at objects is that when you start looking at objects, you can start telling these stories about how people came together, how cultures really interacted. And the one thing that's amazing is that as you look through a museum's collection, you start realizing that cultural connections, cultural contacts, transmission of knowledge, all of these wonderful things that we consider very much part of the modern world were alive and well hundreds if not thousands of years ago. I can certainly tell you from my experience working in museums that rarely do you ever find cultures that are ever contained within themselves. They're always interacting with one another. And if you take that point of view, the fact that cultures do communicate, they work with one another, they develop because of one another, your view of world history suddenly changes. And that's a vital part of what this museum is all about. We want people to realize not only is there wonderful diversity within the artistic past, but that diversity is actually one of the strengths. And through diversity, you actually find wonderful developments that happen over time. And this museum is not simply a museum of Islamic art. It's not simply an art museum. We're here to explore cultural connections. And so as a museum, we stand here to look at things not purely from an artistic point of view, but from a cultural and social point of view, because we truly believe that through looking at art, you can actually learn a lot more about the past and the present. Um, another wonderful object in our collection, this is an astrolabe from Spain from the, from the 1300s, so the 14th century. Again, incredible object, but the reason why this object is so important is because of two things. One of them is that it's an, it's an incredible scientific instrument. All of you guys use GPSs nowadays. Well, that is a 700-year-old GPS. And instead of using satellites that we've lobbed up into space, it uses the stars as the way of giving you fixed points. And from that, to be able to pinpoint where you are in the world. And this is a very powerful 
instrument. But in order for it to have been made, the knowledge of the stars overhead, the knowledge of how the Earth works in its rotation around the sun and its normal rotation and its normal angle, all of this had to be known because you wouldn't have gotten that precision without it. And all of that knowledge was known certainly within the Muslim world during the 14th century. But what's impressive is that it couldn't have been generated within the Muslim world alone. It was developed based on the transmission of knowledge from previous cultures, from the classical world, the Greeks, the Romans, the Byzantines. And it was shared with other cultures. In this case, this astrolabe has inscriptions not only in Arabic, but also in Latin and in Hebrew, which shows you that 14th century Spain was a wonderfully multicultural <coughs> region in which cultures truly did interact and trade knowledge and share things with one another. Again, with objects, you can tell stories that history books simply do not tell you. And that, I think, is one of the most powerful things about the way that <coughs> museums can use their collections to tell stories about the world and really to change perceptions and change mindsets. And I think that's one of the great things that this museum has going for it. It's not simply an art museum. It's a place where, through knowledge, you can actually try to change society as a whole. And so the motto of this museum, uh, Connecting Culture Through the Arts, is very much heart and soul within this institution. Now, my past also includes another museum. And even though I've been at the Aga Khan Museum now for five years, I actually, I actually spent 17 years at the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. And again, if there's a contrast between these museums, just look at that architecture <coughs> compared to the sleek modern lines of the Aga Khan Museum. But even old museums, even old dogs can be taught new tricks. And in the case of the Ashmolean Museum, it's a museum that was founded in 1683, which makes it the oldest museum in the world. And so I had the great privilege when the Aga Khan Museum opened, museum opened of having worked at the oldest and the youngest museum at the same moment, you know, in the same career. And so that, I think, is one of the great things about this museum. It's one of the oldest museums in the world. Now, when I joined the museum, this is what it looked like inside. Very old, very 1920s, 1930s. My job was actually to tear down most of it and then to rebuild the museum and reinterpret its collections. And so when the museum reopened in 2009, it looked much more like this. <clears throat> it looked much more like this inside. Modern architecture behind that facade of the, of the 1840s. And I think what's important about this museum is not just the fact that we changed the architecture. Um, I was actually given free reign to change the entire ethos of the museum. And one of the great things that I was able to do was to reinterpret the collections so that the collections no longer simply spoke to, to cultures living apart from one another, another. We actually looked at how you could reinterpret our collections so that you showed the connections between cultures. And so while the Aga Khan Museum is connecting cultures to the art, the Ashmolean Museum's motto was crossing cultures, looking at cross-cultural exchange and interchange. And so in a sense, these two very, very different museums are linked by very similar ideas. And it shows you that old museums and new museums can embrace these holistic concepts, ones that are very different to what you're used to in museums. And again, it shows you that museums can be brave. They can change over time. And that really brings me to the topic of my talk today, which is, can museums be brave? How do we reinterpret or reinvent the roles of museums in today's world? And really, my starting point is the Aga Khan Museum. It's the Ashmolean Museum, old, modern, old. But all of these museums can change over time. And so I'd like to take you through three or four points in which I'll show you how museums are changing um, in this day and age. Now, I think one of the most obvious ways is that museums are actually designing their exhibitions and their galleries very differently than they did in the past. All I can say is, when you have the chance, go to the State Bank Museum. Because this museum is actually, I think, one of the great displays of numismatics and money that exists. And I can tell you that because I'm a numismatist. And Asma, thank you because 
you actually pronounce numismatics correctly. <laughs> Absolutely, which is highly unusual. Um, but it's a great museum because its starting point is coins and banknotes and other forms of currency and money. Now, that's about as exciting as perhaps a, a collection of hemostats or a collection of petri dishes. It's not exactly the most stimulating material around because when you look at coins lined up, they kind of look <coughs> the same. But when you look at this museum, it doesn't simply try to show the typology of coins over time. It takes you through a journey through the history of money. And I think that's very important because it takes a different theme. It takes a different approach, even though its collections may very much be about systemati systematizing uh, coins across time and across geographies, the interpretation is very different, which means that when you go to this museum, you see different ideas. You see a very different way of presenting the theme, and it's actually a very enjoyable museum, whether you're an adult or a child. And so I think that one thing that you see today is that museums are very much redesigning the way that they show their collections to the public. And I think one example I will highlight is actually, and again, I'll, I'll use very familiar examples. My wife is actually a costume and historian, a uh, dress historian, and she used to work at Kensington Palace before we moved out to uh, Toronto. And Kensington Palace, again, typifies one of these old institutions where history must really dictate things versus a modern approach to design. But even a museum like uh, Kensington Palace was bold enough to say, look, we have this historic material, we have a historic house, but let's explore themes and let's explore designs that are completely avant-garde and take you beyond tradition. And so one of the things they did was create this exhibition called Enchanted Palace about four or five years ago. And the great thing about it is that Kensington Palace has a wonderful collection of historic dress, but they decided to bring in modern designers, contemporary designers, to really challenge the notion of what exactly dress should look like. And so in this case, we have a series of uh, images that show you um, a design of an exhibition, which again, is not what you'd expect in a historic palace. In fact, they brought in designers like Bruce Oldfield to create uh, the dress and to create uh, displays, which again, are not normally part of museology, but help connect people to fashion, because I think when you look at fashion, most people don't really have a grasp of fashion 200, 300 years ago. You look at the fashion you're wearing today, but that's one of the great points of connection. If you want people to understand what people were wearing 200, 300 years ago, why don't you compare it to the way that people are creating dress in this day and age? And you know, as old as a dress may, may look from 200 years ago, <coughs> Believe it or not, that dress was probably cutting edge. And that's very exciting. Because if you look at fashion as cutting edge, and if you can project that to the past, you start understanding the fact that fashion designers 200 years ago were taking risks. They were doing things. They were perhaps looking for something new and original, much in the way, same way that a designer such as Vivian Westwood will, will create something completely wild. <coughs> this is a very interesting design for me because, again, this is the sort of museum that I would hardly expect to take those bold steps, but they were brave. And the reason why, they were looking at their audiences and trying to understand what would actually trigger people to think differently. And this is exciting because if an old museum like this can change, any museum can change the way that it engages with the public. At my old museum, the Ashmolean Museum, we also tried displays which, again, are not part of what is standard museum design. In this case, we took a huge collection of material and put it all on display at once. And again, this is something that you almost never see in today's museum displays. You know, <coughs> museums like taking single objects, putting them on pedestals, and leaving them on their own. But the point here was we wanted people to realize that ceramics of this period were not expensive. They were used very much in this very way. And when you went to a tomb in the Greek world, you'd actually find hundreds of these very cheap ceramic vessels sitting there as dedications on a tombstone. 
And that's what we want people to realize, the fact that even though people look at an object and think it's so valuable because it's so old, in the past it could have been actually very inexpensive. And what you see there is probably closer to reality than what most museums would do with objects of the sort. Elsewhere, one of my favorite displays of, of recent years is the uh, museum in Glasgow, Kelvin Grove, where they actually took natural history and weapons and actually combined them in the same sort of display. And their point was they wanted to show how when it comes to, let's say, a helmet or a sword, a lot of the principles behind the way that people design these things is actually reflecting the way that you see similar things in nature. So for example, when you look at a helmet like the one down below, it's influenced by a rooster. Or you look at a shark, again, when you look at the shark, the streamlined, the form of it, it's again very similar to the way that, that a shark is. And again, this way of combining materials from different, different disciplines together can sometimes be very exciting because it gives people an idea, a sense of things which they may not, never have thought of before simply because you're combining different disciplines together. Uh, this is, I think, a very exciting way of doing things. And also, I think that museums have now become theatrical. Again, how many of you have been to museums of natural history, stuffed animals and showcases? Well, here in the Natural History Museum in Paris, they actually had the animals break out. And again, I think this is very exciting because it shows a sense of theater. It gives people a sense of emotion rather than simply, in a very scientific manner, lining up objects one after the other. Whether it's coins, whether it's animals, whether it's dress, museums are moving away from this old way of, t of displaying objects according to typology. And they're now starting to really look at design and uh, look at ways of doing things in a very creative sort of manner. I think that another thing that you're finding in museums is that museums are now being driven far more by ideas than simply collections. And again, I find this very exciting. In our case, we're driven by behind the idea that you can connect cultures by looking at objects and telling the stories behind them. <laughs> but we're not the only people doing that. Uh, one of the great authors of our day, uh, the Turkish writer Orhan Pamuk, um, incidentally, he's speaking at the Aga Khan Museum in exactly 10 days' time. Uh, he's actually created, he, he wrote a book, which is called The Museum of Innocence. Many of you may have read it, but he's also, in addition to writing this book, he's actually also uh, created his own Museum of Innocence in a house in Istanbul. And the point behind his book is the fact that even though we think of museums as being very static institutions, old institutions, you can actually create museums instantly, looking at objects that have meaning to people, um, even at a very, very personal level. And so when you look at Orhan Pamuk and what he writes about, he wants to challenge the notion that museums have to be based only on objects alone. And he'd like to promote the idea that museums can be based on ideas, perhaps even feelings, notions of things. And again, this is very interesting because it very much challenges the way that museums have operated because museums have always said objects are at the center of museums. Well, now let's look at museums where ideas actually drive them. One of the uh, institutions in London that I think does this very well is actually the Welcome Gallery in London. And again, this is very appropriate to this crowd because Welcome, of course, is a medical institution. They're one of the medical research centers. And they've actually created a gallery which explores that intersection between the arts, culture, and <coughs> science and medicine. And so this, I think, again, is very interesting because you know, you didn't have to do this, but the Welcome Foundation felt very strongly that you could actually create displays, which perhaps because they are the intersection between art and medicine, they may actually explain some of the history and some of the ideas behind medicine better than if you just created a medical gallery. And so this is very interesting, where again, those combinations of ideas, history, medicine, can actually allow people to understand things better 
than if you were just to do it strictly from a scientific point of view. After all, if you were to do a, a display simply on the history of medicine, it could end up being very boring. But if you do it through the lens of artifacts, stories of people, perhaps looking at social history, suddenly you come up with displays and ideas that may actually touch people much stronger than simply a history of medicine, which may only appeal to doctors and nurses. Again, this is interesting because ideas can actually generate new ways of looking at things. Another example of where ideas drive things is the relatively new, it's about five or six years old, museum um, in Lens, which is actually uh, a project by the Louvre in Paris. Uh, they created a satellite museum outside of Paris in a very industrial town of Lens. And one of the things that I find most fascinating is that when they came to displaying the collections that they brought over from Paris, they decided to go completely against the way that it's done in the Louvre. And they actually took a very similar theme to what I did at the Ashmolean, which is to actually look at how you arrange cultures chronologically. And so their displays actually begin at the earliest periods and then move forward <coughs> in time, but it allows you to compare what's happening in Japan versus what's happening in Greece, China, India, so that when you go to a single section, you may see the year 1500 AD, but you'll see it across all cultures. Again, ideas driving museum displays, even though it may be the same objects at your parent museum, this museum is now taking a completely different approach. This is where I think museums are actually very exciting. They're looking at new ways of doing things, they're looking at new ideas. But I think there's another thing that's very important. Museums, I think, are now trying to search for how they can be relevant to their audiences today. And this is very interesting because when you look at a museum, why is a museum relevant? What makes a museum relevant? If I want to see an exhibition of Monet's, why is that relevant to me? Well, museums, I think, are moving towards more and more relevance because they want audiences to engage with them. And I'd like to just show you a few ways in which our museum, the Aga Khan Museum, has been striving to be relevant because we tackle subject matters which a lot of other museums simply don't because we want to actually capture the zeitgeist. We want to be relevant. We want to actually reflect what's happening in the world today. And so, just to give you an example of another museum, earlier this year, and again, it seems so strange to think it was only about nine months ago, Donald Trump imposed this travel ban on eight different countries. Um, I think seven of the eight were from the Muslim world. And so, suddenly, the world for people trying to travel to the US was thrown into chaos. The Museum of Modern Art in New York, it responded by taking off seven or eight objects from its permanent display and putting into their place objects by artists from the very countries that were now subject to the travel ban. Again, that's being brave. That's taking a stand and actually saying, the arts transcend politics. And I thought that was a very good move on their part. For our museum, we actually looked at relevance by creating exhibitions that responded exactly to what was happening. This time last year, we opened up an exhibition called Syria, A Living History. And the reason for it, we wanted to actually show people that the arts and culture of Syria are very diverse, very rich. And what's amazing about this is that we created this exhibition in under 12 months. Most museums take two to three years to create a major exhibition. We did this in 12 months because we felt there was a need to tell the story. And believe it or not, since the Civil War began in Syria, no museum <coughs> apart from ours actually tackled this very subject matter. And I think that one thing that's very important is that we not only looked at the past, we also looked straight up to the present day including works done by artists who were active doing their works at the beginning and in the middle of the Civil War. We wanted to show people that the arts of Syria are from so many different cultures, whether it's from this very early Neolithic period where you have this wonderful, curious sculpture of two humans, we believe, straight through to wonderful objects from the Assyrian period 
As you look through, through Syrian history, so many major civilizations were part of it. There were Greeks, there were Romans, there were Mamluks, there were Ottomans, there were Assyrians, there were Mesopotamians. We wanted people to realize Syrians are not just Syrians. They're part of, part of who they are is part of a very rich and continuous history. Now, the response for it was actually exceptionally strong. And this is a very short video that will give you an idea of the impact وأنا كثير صراحة فخور إني جاي من بلد بعده في بعض محافظ على التاريخ القديم وفي ثقافات كثيرة بعدها موجودة لهلا. I'm from amazing country. I don't forget anything. Every day remembers my home. Every day. Right now, we want people to realize that behind the Syrians we hear about on the news are actually people who are part of a wonderful, rich 5,000-year heritage. And that when you look at their past, even their present, they're part of a very vast, multicultural and diverse set of societies, which most people haven't really even heard about. I don't think there's a subject more topical today than Syria. We all know about what's raging as a civil war in Syria and has been for the last five years. But one of the things that I think we miss out upon is who Syrians actually are. نعم أنا جيت مع عائلتي أنا وزوجتي وعندي طفلة صغيرة هي لسعة صغيرة فهذا الموضوع شوي صعب عليها بس حاليا عم تعمل أصدقاء عم تعمل شو عم تحكي شوية كلمات باللغة الإنجليزية سوريا بلد قديم كتير بيحكي إنه هو بلد قديم فأكيد مثل ما نحن شوفنا في المعرض هون إنه فيه تعدد ثقافات فالآن وصلنا لمرحلة إنه كان قبل الحرب Syria is a example of the unique cultures from all cultures and cultures. Well, the first object I'd like to talk about is actually the first one you see when you come into this exhibition, which is this monumental painting done by Elias Zayat called The Deluge. And so he took the subject of Palmyra. It's a city of so many cultures, so many gods, so many deities that have been part of it. We were all known in Syria, and we were all known in Syria, but we didn't know what to see. فهلا هون نحن بجيتنا على كندا وهالشيء على المتحف يعني تعمان أكثر وعرفنا أكثر التاريخ اللي هي. Now one of the most attractive pieces in this exhibition is a piece of carved ivory in the shape of a lion's head. Now what's very impressive about this piece is the way that the sculptor has been able to infuse this piece of ivory with spirit and life that makes this lion not only ferocious but also quite lovely at the same time. Well, I have to say that. This exhibition talks about the Syrian history. I can describe everything, but everything just amazing. Well, one of my favorite objects in this exhibition is actually the earliest piece that we have in the entire chronology. And this is an eye idol. It's over 5,000 years old. And like so many objects of this prehistoric period, we don't really know what it was there for. You just have this wonderful image of eyes staring back at you. This is one of these objects that actually doesn't tell you all that much, but you have to come up with the stories yourself. With this exhibition, Syria, A Living History, what we try to give our public is a chance to understand that Syrians come from a 5,000 year history of culture and heritage. It gives our public, as well as the Syrian refugees themselves, a chance to reflect upon the heritage and culture that they come from. We have hope. This hope more important for us. You know our country very beautiful, and this country. The thing I would say to the world, the heritage and people of Syria, they won't be defeated. Syrian refugees who came to Canada and again Canada brought in about 30,000 refugees we felt there was a need for public understanding of who Syrians were and again that's a way that museums can be relevant to the events that are happening in this day and age we were also very relevant because at the same time that travel ban took place we opened up an exhibition on Iranian contemporary art and this was very exciting for us because we never believed that Donald Trump would actually help us. Uh, he did because the relevance for this was so 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 vast and so so great. Uh, in fact, the art newspaper described our exhibition as the antidote to Trump's view on Iran. So again, museums can be relevant. They don't have to simply look at the past. They can actually be part of the debate and the dialogue in today's world. 
The last point I'd like to really make is that I think museums are also striving to be relevant. Not only are they trying to change their designs, not only are they looking at ideas, not only are they trying to be relevant, they're also, I think, being, trying to be reflective to the audiences that they actually serve. And this is very different than even the museums I remember growing up, or the museum I first joined as a curator about 20, 25 years ago. Uh, in the past, museums were very much curators deciding what went up and then doing it, and saying, this is what the public should want. I think museums now are asking, what do the public actually want? What information do they need? How do we reflect the communities that are actually the, 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 the audiences who make up the bread and butter of a museum's visitation. And I think that in our case, uh, the Agacan Museum is very reflective. We want to look at who our audiences are. And so one of the exhibitions we have ongoing right now is an exhibition that looks at Canadian contemporary <coughs> art. But in this case, we're looking at Canadians who are Muslims or Canadian artists who are looking at Islamic art as inspiration. And this, again, is very exciting because in a multicultural country where there's a very good sense of Canadianness, you also have to represent groups who are relatively new. Canada is an amazing country because it is actually changing with every new immigrant that comes to the country. Its flavor, its quality, who Canadians are is changing. And so it's very important to be able to reflect upon that through the arts. And again, I think artists are wonderful communicators for showing how a nation actually views itself and how individual artists identify, in this case, as being Canadian or being different. And so here, we're trying to be reflective of the people uh, who make up our, our, our audiences. We also, at the museum, and this is, I think, very exciting, we also look at what drives people, what, what audiences could we capture that we normally don't because we may not be open during the hours when they're active? And so one of the things we recently did was we opened up all night long in this festival in Toronto called Nuit Blanche. So while most people see the museum like this, we were also very much open at night. And what we did was we not only showcased um, and created this wonderful installation by a Pakistani artist, Shazia Sikander. We created this amazing display in the park, and over 5,000 people that night came to see this one artwork. That's tremendous. And again, it's because we're trying to look at a younger audience, people who might respond to this. We also, we also put up in our park two yurts, Mongolian yurts, and we had 19 different performances over the course of the entire evening, straight up until 6 in the morning. And we had about uh, 2,000 people who attended these. And again, it's a younger crowd. It's a different crowd. It's one that may be motivated by listening to the performing arts. Again, we're trying to be reflective and responsive to the audiences that are out there. We also have hosted in the museum and its park um, dance and festival from South Asia. And again, the reason why is that we do have a very strong South Asian audience for this museum. This museum, by doing things like this, suddenly the museum becomes their own museum. And that's very much part of what I think a lot of museums are trying to do today. We also try to reflect upon you know, projects that may not necessarily be considered art projects, but are very important. <coughs> for example, there's a wonderful project that's taken place in Afghanistan, in Kabul in which uh, a German NGO has taught young girls how to skateboard in order to build up their confidence. And again, you look at Kabul of, you know, of, of the last decade or so, it's a tough city, it's a tough country to live in, but to give young girls the chance to develop their confidence through skateboarding, what a wonderful sort of story. Well, there's a photographer who uh, took photographs of these girls and created these wonderful uh, portraits as well as some action shots. And we actually created the Skate Girls of Kabul as an exhibition in the park. We also hosted our own skateboarding lessons for youth uh, in this pop-up skate uh, park that we created just about a month ago. So again, museums are moving beyond just the pure arts and again, trying to reflect the interests of its people. The final thing I just want to talk about is museums are also, I think, trying to really embrace creativity. 
Um, our museum, I'm very pleased to say, is not just a museum of historic arts. We're also very concerned about the, the current arts. And one of the first exhibitions we did as a museum was an exhibition on contemporary art from Pakistan, in particular looking at six artists who come from the National College of Arts in Lahore. And one of the pieces that we had commissioned was one by Aisha Khalid, this wonderful tapestry, which is about five meters by three meters. And what's incredible about this tapestry is that it looks like it's made out of embroidery, but in truth, it's made out of 1.2 million drawing pins that have been pushed through from one side to the other. Again, there's amazing creativity that you have to harness so that people can realize a country like Pakistan has amazing artists. And the reason why I'm here, apart from giving a lecture at AKU, is because there's a Karachi Biennale happening in the next few days and over the next couple weeks. The contemporary art scene in this country is very rich. You see some amazing artists come out of it, and I want the world to see this. Likewise, we had uh, uh, Imran Qureshi, her husband, create this wonderful pavement <coughs> art outside the museum. Again, world famous artists coming from Pakistan who are having impact in the Western world. We also created a very innovative exhibition earlier this year, which is called the Syrian Symphony. And it was very much a follow up, on, follow -up to that exhibition, Syria Living History. But one thing that's absolutely amazing is that in this case, we combined music with the, with the visual arts to create a display that no one has really ever seen in a museum before. And I'm just going to really finish by showing you this video and then saying a few remarks just to close. <laughs> Syrian Symphony, New Compositions in Sight and Sound, is exactly that. It's new compositions by visual artists and by musicians. It's an exhibition where music is part of the experience. <coughs> like a symphony, the exhibition is divided into four movements. We have four pieces of music that one encounters throughout their journey. They're related to specific works within the exhibition, but they also speak to one another. There are many conversations between the experience of sound and the experience of sight. This exhibition, Syrian Symphony, all starts with one painting, People in Power, by Ahmed Mo'ala, a Syrian artist. In this very powerful painting, he depicts a scene with figures that evokes all sorts of ideas. It evokes, for me, the idea of music. There are trumpets and other instruments within the composition. It appears there's a conductor conducting a great big orchestra. And that gave us the idea of Syrian symphony. Given the events that unfolded in Syria beginning in 2011, the question that occurred to all of us was, what is the role of artists and of art during times of conflict? One of the really unique aspects of this exhibition is the fact that many artists created works specifically for the spaces. They responded to not only what's going on in Syria, but to one another and what's going on in the exhibition. So clarinetist Kenan Azmi recorded his piece inspired and moved by Mo'ala's painting. And Kavork, when he was here, responded to Kenan's composition by working directly on the walls as he listened. He used a monotype printmaking technique to create this painting, representing the displacement of people and the movement of cultures. Another fascinating aspect of the exhibition is how technology can connect the past, the present, and the future. We have a replica of the Hurrian hymn, which was discovered in Ugarit, Syria in the 1950s. And this tablet is the oldest piece of written music that we know of. We worked with musician Malik Jindali, who was born near Ugarit, to record his interpretation as a pianist living today of this 3,400-year-old written piece of music on a disclavier piano using electronic MIDI files. <coughs> Similarly, technology allowed Icon M a Paris-based company to use drone footage taken of Palmyra after it had been destroyed by ISIS. 
It shows us in detail the state of this ancient site and hopefully gives us enough information to be able to rebuild in the future. other artists who recorded musical pieces specifically for this exhibition. We presented Syrian Symphony in partnership with Silk Road, and the Silk Road Ensemble was in residence here and recorded a work specifically for this installation. One of the joys of this exhibition was thinking about ways in which we could engage visitors. We invited newcomer musicians to record a piece, and we have portraits of newcomer families. Our team developed a series of symbols as a way to allow people to respond, not by having to write something, but by choosing an emotion that they were feeling as they experienced this exhibition. And we found something interesting, that the icon that was the most popular was the icon representing hope. And I think that is a message we do want to give through this exhibition. Museums today are actually undergoing a lot of transformation. They are actually reinventing themselves. They're actually being brave. And I think this is one of the one of the abiding aspects, certainly of the museum world, but particularly of the art economy. Um, one of the reasons why I've been very proud to be part of this museum over five years is that we are willing to take the risks. We're willing to be relevant, to be creative, to be reflective to design things in beautiful ways. And again, I think that is an exemplar, not only of this museum, but also the virtues of what happens within the Occupant Development Network. And so I leave you with that thought, but I thank you for taking the time to listen to these thoughts on the ways that museums can be brave today. Thank you very much. I sincerely hope you have enjoyed this presentation. Thanks, Dr. Kim, for giving us a wonderful presentation. I think from this presentation, the museums are getting more dynamic, relevant, with a blend of history, culture, and arts. Thank you very much. We have about 10 minutes for question and answer session. I would request you to first identify yourself and keep the question short and brief. Thank you. Uh, Ibrahim from the medical school. And my question is that recently the Google Mind had to remove a couple of pieces due to animal rights groups. Uh, where do museums draw the line between uh, works that hurt people's feelings and protecting art rights, uh, artists' rights of free speech. Thank you. That's actually, that's, actually, that's actually an amazing question because it is one of the most current <coughs> issues uh, museums are facing. Um, yes, the Guggenheim had uh, some uh, artwork that animal rights activists felt uh, were harmful. And so, uh, the Guggenheim decided to pull these objects out of that exhibition. And it really did create quite a divide within the art world because, as you say, artists have, you know, by creating the works, it is a form of expression. And by, you know, are you censoring art by doing so? That's essentially the question. And I think that when you look at museums, we all struggle with this issue because you, you are often faced with artwork that is highly controversial. And so the question is, do you, do you, which sides do you listen to? Can you be brave in some circumstances? Or in other cases, do you have to fold to what may be actually public pressure to take an object off of the display? Fortunately, we've never had that issue ourselves. Um, in the case of the Guggenheim, they felt very strongly they needed to take it off. Um, I've always applied a very simple rule, and that is simply good taste. And again, as a museum director, you know, what exactly does that mean? I can't define it for you. 
but I think it's very much you have to look at an artwork and it, it really comes down to experience to think whether it is controversial enough to take off or not. I actually believe that in the case of the Guggenheim, the curators had it right. And sorry, in the sense that they should have, they, by selecting it in the first instance, they had made that choice. And um, you know, I think that I would certainly side on the curatorial side for, for having kept it on display rather than removing it. Hello. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, I'm Jazz. Uh, I just want uh, your comments uh, regarding some news coming from uh, a very rich and dynamic sort of country, which is called India, where they have, uh, you know, delisted the name of Taj Mahal from the favorite, uh, you know, tourist spots. Though it is, you know, uh, World Heritage list of UNESCO. Uh, what's your comment on this, please? Well, again, I think this is where politics are starting to get in the way. And let's face it, how can you? Uh, ignore the Taj Mahal as one of the great wonders of the modern world, as one of the great marvels of architecture. And so, yes, politics do intervene. But that's where I think that, quite honestly, the popular public will never ignore it. And so even though governments may choose to take these decisions, or authorities may choose to take these decisions, these will never last. Mike, so I'll go ahead with my question. Um, the task of cultural bridging, which the museum is, so, is doing so well, also means questioning politics. And one of the museums that I remember really well from the many museums I've seen is the museum in Bristol, uh, <coughs> which is the Commonwealth Museum. Small museum, uh, an amazingly political museum on colonialism, and a very brave one, if I might add, given the imperial nostalgia that you see in Britain all the time. So how, uh, I just want to know your take on what it means, how much bravery has to do with questioning politics rather than just giving an avenue for artists from battered lands. Uh, that's one question. And the second is just a request and a comment. <coughs> The last video was phenomenal. Is it online? Uh, yes, that video is online. So look at our YouTube page, and you'll see probably around 40 or 50 videos. One thing I should point out or make mention of is the fact that this museum is now putting as much of its material online as possible. And, and the reason why is that we want this museum and what we do to have impact beyond just Toronto and Canada. Now back to the question of do museums have to always challenge politics? No, they don't. I think it's very much context specific. In the case of the Commonwealth Museum, there are many issues about the empire that actually had to be challenged, whether it was that or even slavery, which is another major part of that museum. And what's amazing is that I think that as you look through time, while you may challenge an issue in this year, 10 years from now, suddenly people won't be looking at that as a challenge because minds have actually changed. And I think that if museums are looking at changing minds, changing perceptions, you do have to start by challenging a few things. And the, again, which, what those things are very much dependent on the museum and its circumstance. Uh, <coughs> my name is Mohamed Gyal. I am the customer of museum. First, I am very much thankful to provide me the opportunity. This time, you have selected a very dry subject because museum, we, I, my children, this time I am 74 years, but I never asked my children to visit the museum. We asked our children to visit the cinema or mountain or other places. And you, you, you know the international, there are some international days, international teacher's day, international hospital day, but there is no any international hospital day. So I will request only that if you are interested that really museum should be blamed to so from the UN uh, platform, they, they should also select some days for the uh, museum. And during this demonstration, you also mix gallery <laughs> and other. So I hope the museum is so different from this, uh, because they, they are some ancient features and things which are the collected here. 
So I will first you that in Karachi there is some national museum. They have very valuable items to there. So if you have time, you should visit that. Uh, you will also take some uh, new ideas from it. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. My name is Saira, and I'm representing Art Now Pakistan. I just have a question regarding contemporary exhibitions that you hold at the museum. Uh, how do you go about it? Do you have people sending in proposals, or do you put out a call uh, with a theme? And if there's a website where you do this, we, if we could kind of connect with that? No, I mean, most of our exhibitions, contemporary exhibitions we create, are very much self-generated. So we look at an issue, and we start looking at how we can do that. We haven't gone to call for papers or call for exhibitions simply because if you do that, you'll get f like 500 proposals in a very short period of time. We, we, of course, want to focus what we do much more specifically. And again, Syrian Symphony, or you know, the, that last exhibition you saw through the video, was very much a brainwave that was thought of and executed in six weeks. Yeah, my name is Ali. Um, okay, my name is thankful to you. I want to ask that how can the uh, history can we make more interesting via museum? Like, how can we dictate our past? Uh, like, we have different culture from the Fatimid period to, in Al Khan Museum over there. There are a number of things to that. How can we dictate uh, present and past and future for the museum? in different exhibitions. Yeah. Well, again, I, that, that's actually a very big topic. You can, you know, how exactly do you make um, history relevant, exciting to people? What can you learn from the past to the present? I've always believed in something very simple. Look at what you do today, and look at so many things that we do, and we're, we always say that it's novel. It's, we're the first who ever did it. And I'll tell you this, chances are, you'll find something analog analogous to it hundreds, if not a thousand years ago. And I think that's the sort of curiosity that people should have. We all think the internet is so revolutionary. Well, it is. But there was also something also exceptionally revolutionary, which was movable type. And that, too, transformed the world, because suddenly you didn't have to simply copy things out as manuscripts. You printed hundreds of books, and then eventually thousands, if not millions. The dissemination of information and knowledge, well, that sounds like the internet. Well, look back to the 14th, 1400s, and you find exactly the same thing. Even, you know, we all use these <coughs> mobile phones and tap away at it. Interestingly, there was a very similar sized bit of informa uh, information technology uh, from 5,000 years ago, which is known as a cuneiform <coughs> tablet. And people would actually take uh, wet, wet clay and write through notes, which eventually got preserved because they dried out. Same sort of thing happened over 5,000 years ago. Again, I always tell people, if you want to make history interesting, look at the present, be curious, and then look backwards, and you will find things that will amaze you. Hi, uh, well, this is Mohammed. I'm from the surgical department. Uh, once again, thank you very much. It's been very refreshing to hear things like these uh, spoken about within the hospital. So quick question. We now have this new trend, and that comes across in the architecture of uh, the Iki Bahafan Museum, and then you have, for example, the Reign of Light and the new Louvre that's coming up in Abu Zabi as well. So that's a very different trend from what we're traditionally used to. Traditionally, it's old buildings with a sense of history and a past. It's what was in them that you go and you see it, and that's the experience. And now you have all these new structures that are trying to integrate intelligent architecture and technology. Do you think that's the definitive path all museums are going to take eventually, or is it just a path? I don't think it's necessarily a thing all museums will take, but I think when you look at architects of today, the principle behind the way you design a museum is vastly different than the way you did 100 years ago. 100 years ago, it was all about how many rooms can you get to shove as many objects in as possible. Um, whereas today, we look at architecture in a very different way. We look at the way that the user experiences the space first, and then we start developing the museum around that and the architecture. And so I think that 
you know, what we see here is not so much a museum fad, but it's actually really just a human, you know, architects re relating back to, to human experience. And I think that's really what's, be, what's driving it. Now, not all museums will take that approach. I mean, some will try more traditional forms of architecture. But I think that the one thing that's exciting about museums today is that with new architectural projects, you can completely transform the way that your collections are actually viewed. And in our case, this is very much the case because there are no walls within our galleries. Um, it's slightly annoying for museum professionals because you want more of those walls. Uh, even the whole idea of having light come into galleries. Museum, <coughs> museum professionals like, uh, they're, they're kind of like radiologists. They like to be placed in dark rooms and uh, you know, have no light come in there. My, my father's a radiologist, so I know this. Um, but in truth, you can bring light into a museum. It's part of the experience of going to a space like that. It enhances the experience. The Louvre Abu Dhabi is amazing. And it will be amazing for generations. But I'll tell you this. In 25 years, it may be viewed as simply average, because there may be other great architectural projects that come about. And so I think when it comes to museums, <coughs> architecture does change a lot over time. It may not necessarily be because museums are doing it. I think it's because architects are thinking differently. We have time for one last question. Okay, so second last and the last one. Uh, my name is Rani. Um, my question is about, um, I see you have a great auditorium there. Uh, do you have sessions that are talking about Islam? The overall, the museum is trying to portray what the true essence, as, as you rightly say, it, it's, it's in today's time, it's important to portray uh, the face of Islam that people are ignoring. So do you have sessions that can go across, like this one is being recorded and it goes across, there's a link anybody in the world can click on it and they can sit and listen in to the session. Are you organizing such, such uh, lectures or talks um, at the museum? We, we have done a few of them this way. Eventually, yes, all of our lectures of the sort should be available online for people to catch <coughs> into. Um, the way that we do it now, and we've done a few live broadcasts like what you've talked about. We're not there yet, we've got to get the technology right, but what we do is make sure that our lectures are available online so people can view them as podcasts. And I think that's actually quite important because anything that happens intellectually within our museum should be available to people thereafter. And in fact, I think that the lecture by Ross Burns that you may have next week. We have an event next Wednesday. Ross Burns is actually someone we know very well because he was the historical, con the historical consultant for Syria living history for us. And he, gave, he gives a wonderful <coughs> lecture about, about uh, Syria, its architecture, and its history. The city and the architect. OK, so the last online question. <coughs> So the last question is from a student of the uh, student of anthropology in the College of Worcester, Saeed Hussain. He asks, "How is social history represented in modern museum in respect to subaltern, uh, for example, minorities, genders, etc., in museums that deal with cultures in the past having patriarchal or traditions of slavery?" Well, if you're looking at uh, that particular question, traditions of slavery and patriarchy. Again, I think you tend to find those more in very specialty museums. So, uh, for example, the Museum in Bristol, uh, that very good question that was asked earlier, actually has had exhibitions about slavery and looked into this part as part of a, part of a colonial past. Uh, matri or patriarchal, I've seen less of, to tell you the truth. But I think that where you find this is, it tends to show up in temporary exhibitions where you look at a particular subject matter and really explore it in depth. And again, I think that these are the questions museums should be exploring. Uh, they may not be explored very much right now, but I'm sure that through time you will find more of it. Well, then, Mr. Kim, once again, I'll request you to stay on the stage. And I'll request again Dr. Asma Ibrahim to present our guest with a small gift as a token of our presentation.
and thanks, Dr. Ibrahim.